Um, and this is where we kind of started. We'll get to the Schefter. We'll get to the Camilla Duvall. But this is where we kind of started this morning. Take a listen to this. This is the latest from uh, Shams. Don't call him Shams until he can say Pajemski correctly. Here's the latest on the dubs and the jazz. The Warriors and Jazz, they have continued conversations. It's just the Jazz are in a position right now. and th They wouldn't be even thinking about moving Larry, Larry Markkinen if this was a team that is trying, like Ryan knows, if you're trying to compete and win, that's a guy you compete and win with. This is a team that obviously is going down more of a rebuilding path and is if you're going to rebuild and you're trying to compete for not a playoff berth, but probably the number one overall pick, you have to consider. I don't think they want to move Larry Markkinen, but if mm. the Golden State Warriors put in a Brandon Podzemski and, you know, from what I'm told, three first-round picks, three, four unprotected pick swaps, you know, is three, four second-round picks. Is that a name? Uh, Kaminga's a name, but I think, I think the Jazz, from everything I've been told, the Jazz are more focused on Brandon Podzemski and mm. his inclusion in the deal, all the picks being in the deal. And I think from the Warriors' perspective, it's Podzemski, but then there's not the all, all the picks. And if it's all the picks, then there's not going to be a Pazemski. And so this could be a back and forth. But both sides are kind of entrenched right now at where they're at, saying nothing is going to change. So only time will tell. But I think the Jazz are very comfortable with extending Larry Markin. And at that point, you'll see more suitors potentially as well in him, not just teams that feel like, okay, we'll be able to resign him. So when I heard this, I immediately, like my BS muscle, this is different than uh, my Olympics muscle, my BS muscle started to uh, contract a little bit because I'm like, I, th th this doesn't make any sense. What, what, what are we talking about here? Um, listen to, first of all, just the aspect of what he's suggesting the Jazz are asking for. First of all, apparently there's num somebody named Pazemski that is involved in this, and the Jazz would like to have him. So, okay, let's say the Warriors give him this mythical man named Pazemski. And then he argues that the uh, Warriors, he goes three first-round picks, three or four unprotected pick swaps, three or four Second round picks, and at certain point, as he's talking, I'm like, "What? Where are you going? Like, what are you? How much more? <laughs> right? What, what are you talking about? No, like that's not a thing. We're not doing ten to twelve draft picks. But then, Dibs, there was a second piece that that really, and and every so often, as we talk about stuff like this, it sets in. Why would Shams on the daily be given this information by the Jazz and the Warriors? Why are we on this daily journey of an update? Here's what the Jazz want. Here's what they're saying. Here's what the Warriors want. Here's what they're saying. All the deals that have actually gone down, Bridges and DeJounte Murray and et cetera, all of these deals, you don't, you don't get that. You don't get a daily update. You don't get to know exactly what everyone's saying to each other all of the time. So that tells me posturing. That tells me leverage. That tells me fishing expedition. Why on earth would these teams want Shams out there on the daily just telling everybody exactly where things are if these were genuine talks? I don't buy it. Yeah, I think that it would be kind of as a trial balloon. Utah's throwing out if you know Shams is reporting what Utah would be reportedly seeking, and it's a gigantic sort of a package of players and picks, and then the Warriors come back and float their balloon about what they might be willing to offer, and it's way, way less. And so it's a way to signal to other teams what the asking price might be. And also I think as a point of leverage with Laurie Markinen as far as what you know, the viability is of him being traded. And so it's just a way to put out mostly misinformation. The one thing about it that I find to be curious as well is that you don't hear any other team and what any other team might reportedly be offering for Laurie Markin. And so Interesting is it point. really just the Warriors? Are they the only ones who are allegedly pursuing Laurie Markin? Are there other teams who are remaining silent? but are also working back channels to get the player. It feels to me like this is just the Warriors and the Jazz, which tells me that it's probably unlikely to happen. Well, uh, I, I agree with you. I think that's an interesting point. Shams has reported them as the, quote, most engaged. 
Not the only. So but what you're are right. the other teams like? Nobody's bringing up anything. Yeah, I haven't heard any other player and, being linked to this from any other team. And it makes me wonder if the Warriors are a mark. Uh, not a mark and in, just a yeah. mark. Because And the reason for that would be Danny Ainge is sitting here going, okay, I'm, not, I'm really not that interested in trading Lowry Markkanen. I don't want to do this. He's 27 years old. He's a really good player. He's still ascending. Um, are we willing to extend him? Does that make all the sense for us to spend that money? Maybe not, but hell, we got to spend it on somebody to a degree. So um, we want Lowry Markkanen on the team. If that's his main thing that he wakes up thinking. But I do know that the Knicks just gave up like their next decade of assets for Mikhail Bridges. Yeah. Boy, I wonder if the market right now would suggest that there's somebody who would do something crazy. All right, let me canvas the league. Who would do something crazy? Who's desperate? In terms of time. Right. Who doesn't have time on their side? I would think about uh, the Warriors would be a team that doesn't have time. Who who needs, who needs feels they need to do something, they need to do it now, and they might act from emotion because we could, in fact, even extend Markinen and we could still trade him. So there's no risk in us extending Lowry Markinen and spending money that we don't want to spend because if we do that, we could just trade him in February. Or well, we could trade him next offseason. He will still be incredibly viable and wanted. And in fact, that kind of money leaves it open for people to trade expiring contracts. And I would argue that if we waited till next offseason, if we're Utah, this brings even more people to the party. Right, right. But we might as well put this out there to see if there's somebody who wants to do something crazy. Crazy. Who would do that? Perhaps the Golden State Warriors. and No harm in checking. Absolutely not. And when you look at what Brooklyn got, they got Bogdanovich, Diakite, Shake Milton, three players who are either non-factors or toward the end of their career. They got unprotected first in 2025, 27, 29, and 31. So four first-round unprotected picks, <laughs> a swap in 2028 that's not protected, a top four protected pick next year that comes via the Bucks and a second round pick in 2025. So they got four picks, actually five firsts, a swap and a second, as well as three players who don't really factor into what they're trying to do. So if you're Utah and you look at that package, you think, all right, Warriors, maybe we can get Pajimski, Pazimski, and we can get three or four firsts, four swaps and a second because that's the going rate. And the other part of this, Mark, is what does Laurie Markinen want? Does he want just the money and I don't care if I'm a jazz or not? Or does he want to be able to kind of control his future destination? Because he can he can do a lot in this deal to force Utah's hand. Right now he can. He has the leverage right now if there were a trade of saying, you know, to a team, I'm not signing an extension with you. And I would bet, I would think if I'm Laurie Markinen and I play with Utah. Do I want to go to San Francisco and play next to Steph Curry for the next few years? My bet would be yes, but I don't know the guy. I don't know what he wants, but you're right that right now, today, this month, he's got some leverage that in theory would go away as soon as he signs the extension. I have a question for yeah, you guys. What's, up? Um, what's on my mind, I think everything you're saying there is right, and I agree with it. And obviously Utah, if they believe they can sign Lowry to an extension, then there's no pressure for them to do anything. What if Markinen says, I mean, he's 27. Utah's not anywhere close to competing. It's not like he's super young and not like he's 24 and has an ability to maybe hang around for a few down years. What if he approaches Danny Ainge and just says, I'm not signing an extension with you. I'll play out my last year and then I'm leaving for nothing. So either trade me now or lose me for nothing. Well, that that is a very interesting scenario that I have certainly not heard is a part of his thought process. When I when I hear things like that, it makes me go, okay, let me let's let's look into the guy for a second and 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 think about because I think Brandon Ayuk is in a situation like what you're talking about. Where if you put money in, this is why I think it's so interesting that he's playing this game of chicken. And we'll get to the Brandon thing in a little bit. But he's playing this game of chicken where he's coming from a spot where, yes, he got first round money. Yes, 
There's a fifth-year option that's been picked up. Brandon Ayuk has been very well compensated, but has he gotten the like, dude, you're set for life? No, like the no. big bag. Well, this year he's getting fourteen million, and that's a lot of money. But that's not sixty-seven guaranteed. No, no, it's not any of those things. So Brandon, I think you put the right bag in front of him. He's got to say yes because it's the first time. Okay, how about Lowry? We're talking about an extension. That would be, I would think, north of $200 million. Okay? Now, that is the big bag. What has he gotten to this point in his career? Well, I mean, if you do look at, I mean, he's scheduled this year to make 18. Last three years, he's uh, 15-6, 16-7, 17-2. He signed a deal for four and 67 a number of years ago. Okay. Which is, and, that's the medium size bag. Right. Right, and the career earnings for Lowry Markkinen right now sit at around 70. Yeah. So the big bag, no. However, is this person someone who could do what Grandy is suggesting, play a little chicken, like, and take a risk? I'm going to play out my contract. Could tear an ACL, but I'm going to play out my contract and I mean, I'm gone. He, yeah, like, could you take that chance? Got 70 mil in the bank. Yes, but 70 I mean, is not probably, 200. Yeah. So, like, that's a, that my guess would be no, he wouldn't take that risk. The other but piece, he could, he, could, he could. And the interesting thing is, he can't sign. I'm right in saying this, right, Grandy? He can't sign until August 6th. That's correct. But if he signs on August 7th, they can't trade him until at the end of the year. Next correct, year. correct, after the season. So if you're marking in, you can kind of play with that August 6th, August 7th date, and, you know, you can say, yeah, I want an extension, and, you know, you can you can trade me where I want to be traded, or I can drag my feet, and you can sign me on uh, August 7th, and now you can't trade me until the end of the year. But I don't know if that's actually a risk for Utah. Utah's chilling, right? Like, Utah says, fine, then you're tradable after the year. Yes, We're not I, trying to win. We I don't guess. care. You're right, but I think that they'd rather get to February and have the option of trading him at the I, deadline I, where I, you're going to have more teams. If he signs an extension and it's $50 million a year, yeah. and you get to February in the trade deadline and he is eligible to be traded, that $50 million has power in the market at the trade deadline. No doubt, and he's a young player who could help put someone over the top. Exactly. And it's that maximum team, flexibility. Yeah, you're exactly. right about that. So if you're marking in, you can play that game a little bit too. Like, you know, hey, if I really want to be a warrior, let's get this thing done on August 6th. I'll sign. It'll be a sign and trade, and we'll make this happen and now. One thing we've never heard in this whole process is anything from Lowry. Yeah, true. I have no clue what he wants. I don't even wants. know who his agent is. No clue what is he wants. Scott Boris? You know what I mean? Does he, <laughs> if it's Scott Boris, then you can damn well bet <laughs> he ain't signing for another four years. <laughs> Scott Boris just loves to wait. Just loves to wait and wait and wait. Uh, oh, go- his agent is Boris. Boris Lechitsky. Bor- <laughs> Michael Boris Lechitsky. I like that guy. Yeah. Pajemski. Pajemski. Pronounce it right. Uh, let's go to Kyle and Sunnyvale. Pajowski. Hi, Pajemski. Kyle. Uh, what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing, Kyle? Hey there. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, I just wanted to say that I think the Warriors should go go forward with uh, trading Pajemski and the picks. I think that, you know, with everything that Steph's given to the franchise, I think that you it, you owe it to him to try to maximize this roster and i think that if you add the gems i mean if you add uh, laurie markin and you're still able to keep kaminga maybe you get more from wiggins next year uh you've added some great pieces with the anthony melton who honestly would probably be a better starter uh, alongside steph than pajemski and you've got gp2 so if that can he can kind of give you some of that same defense that you get from pajemski I just think that, you know, yeah, are they, are they a championship team? Probably not, but they're, they're going to be a legit uh, uh, playoff contender. And, you know, everyone thought last year that Denver was a lock for the finals, and then they ended up getting knocked out in the second round, so you never know what could happen. So that's my two cents. Yeah, Kyle, thanks. Look, I, I, I don't have any issue with any of that. However, I think there's a simplification in, in that point that, that probably needs to be cleaned up, and here's what I mean by that. If you're simply going, hey, would I give up pods for Lowry Markkinen? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the problem. It's so much more complex than that. First of all, the salaries need to match. 
And pods doesn't get you anywhere near marketing. So a bunch of other stuff's going to have to be mixed in there. And I'm betting Moses Moody would be at least a part of the deal. And then you're going to need salary matchers. Is that Kavon Looney, GP2? I know Warrior fans would love it to be Wiggins. The Jazz aren't doing that. But but here's what the Jazz actually want, in addition to Pazemski and Pajemski. Yeah. The Jazz are going to want all of your picks. All of your picks. Like all of your picks for the next seven years. And I have largely been an F them picks kind of a guy in this particular situation, but it depends on what we're talking about. You know what I mean? If you want to talk about a couple first rounders and a couple first round pick swaps or something like that, okay, I, my ears are open. If you start talking about four first round picks, four first round pick swaps, four second round, like what are we doing? And if that's what the Jazz is literally saying they're on the phone, then yeah, call their bluff because they're actually not even bluffing. They're just wasting your time. They're just messing around to see if you'll do something ridiculous. Uh, the Warriors are not going to do something ridiculous, I don't think. I don't think so either. And the the thing that makes it so interesting to me, other than how many picks and what other throw-ins will be there, because I know that you've got Kavon at eight million, you got GP two at nine point one. Those are pieces that would need to be a part of it. I think that Moody would be somebody at five point eight that would be in the deal. But Utah wanting Pajemski more than they want Kaminga allegedly is surprising to me on two fronts. One, I think Kaminga's a better player, and he has a bigger upside. But the other piece of it is Utah wanting optionality. They want to have the financial flexibility that comes with Brandon Podjemski, who's making 3.5, 3.7, and 5.7. So if you're Utah, you get a slightly lesser player, but GP2 will be off the books. Looney would be off the books. Moody would be off the books. And... Pods would be at an unbelievably good price, as opposed to Kaminga, if you acquired him, yeah, he'd be off the books, and you could, I think you would have him as a restricted free agent, That's correct. and you could match, but he's probably going to get 30 to $35 million a year in an extension form. Yeah, yeah, he's not, he's the opposite of an expiring contract. And he's, he's the, about to yeah. exponentially jump. And he would hurt your ability to have that optionality yeah. that, that a rebuilding team normally wants. And I think that's probably a lot about it. Like, Pajemski is a very safe acquisition in that you already know that he's a smart, winning player um, who will continue to get better. He is definitely a piece. No, no matter what your team is or what you're trying to do, he's definitely a piece that you can work with and very cost-controlled, very cheap for for a little while. That, that to me, is what, uh, what the Jazz are. 